All right, thank you all very much for coming. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Spencer Jones today, who is visiting from Texas A&M. Spencer originally hails from England and did a physics undergrad at the University of Oxford and then moved to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography to do a PhD in essentially large-scale oceanography with Paula Chessy and um, did some wonderful contributions to our understanding of the overturning circulation and interbasin exchanges, etc. And today we will learn more about some of the, that work, more focused on heat transport in the Atlantic. And I am very excited to hear what you have to talk about. Uh, just to complete your CV, you went from Scripps to La Monde, yes. did a postdoc for two years, three years? Three years. Three years at uh, Columbia, yeah. and then you now have been at Texas a and for a couple of years, yeah, two and a half. The rest is all you. Thank okay. You. Uh, Thanks, Till. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about heat transport by the overturning the gyres, and this is a work that came out of my, a, a little bit, it's kind of inspired by my PhD work, um, and but it really, my PhD work was on idealized models, and this work is really starting to dig into more realistic uh, models, and, and particularly it's about this kind of new diagnostics for heat transport and how. Um, we can apply them uh, to climate models. Um, so uh, I, I thought I'd give you an outline of the talk first. I don't know whether I should, I actually might stand over here, maybe that makes more sense. Okay, then I can see you better. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the, the talk is about heat transport and how we want to split the heat transport between heat transport by the AMOC and heat transport by the gyres. And so I'll give you some introduction first. I'll talk about heat transport and heat transport variability. Um, and then I'll particularly talk about AMOC in the CSM large ensemble. Um, and then I'll talk about some different methods for separating the heat transport by the overturning circulation and the heat transport um, by the gyres. And then I'll talk about my new stream function splitting method. Um, and then I'll show you some results of doing that. And then if there's time, I have some more slides beyond this, which are actually about um, a slightly different topic, which is related. It's about looking at um, how, how we can do this in a more Lagrangian kind of way. Um, right, so this talk is gonna be focused on these kinds of methods, more traditional methods, and, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the Lagrangian way uh, later. So, Many of you will know this, um, but in fact, right, heat transport in the Atlantic is northward everywhere. So this is um, a figure that shows heat transport as a function of the latitude um, in the ocean. And so the black line is for the global ocean. And you can see right here, there's northward um, heat transport uh, in the northern hemisphere generally. And right then it's negative here, which means there's southward heat transport in the southern hemisphere. And the blue line shows that the, the piece of the heat transport that's happening in the Atlantic Ocean is northward, regardless of what latitude you're, you're at. Um, basically, always the Atlantic is, is transporting heat northward, and that's because there is the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Um, and so, yeah, this, this northward heat transport forms the northern hemisphere, and um, I think this room probably knows better than most places, right? If the AMOC were to shut down, um, which we don't know, maybe it could, it could be possible, um, then um, the changes in the climate would be quite big. Um, so this is, these are, this is some simulations presented by Jackson et al. 2015, and what they show is that um, the air temperature, if you have AMOC shut down, the air temperature across the whole of the Northern Hemisphere um, gets much cooler, and the sea surface temperature also gets much cooler, particularly in the North Atlantic. And then the intertropical convergence zone shifts, and so you have a change in the precipitation, and you have a huge reduction in precipitation um, over here, and you have an increase in precipitation uh, further south because that ITCC moves further south. And so, right, this is kind of a large scale picture of what is the AMOC doing. It's moving heat northward, and it's keeping the intertropical convergence zone at, the, at this more northern latitude um, than the equator. 
Now, okay, so that was all about kind of the meme situation. Um, now I want to talk about peak content trends. So if you look over here, um, this is temp the temperature trend in the top 700 meters between 1990 and 2004, and it's, it's based on uh, real data. This is like a model that's, that's kind of tuned to data assimilating. Um, and so um, you can see there was an increase in heat content um, between 1990 and 2004, and then there was a reduction in heat content um, between 2005 and 2014. And so this is kind of the kind of thing that can happen in the North Atlantic. We have decadal variability of the heat content um, in the North Atlantic, and we want to explain where is that decadal variability come from, coming from. And so this paper, Robson et al., they did a little bit of that explanation um, by looking at, in their model, um, the density in the deep Labrador Sea, which is this red line, versus um, the, the temperature and salinity um, in the subpolar North Atlantic. And so what they found was, right, there's this increase in around 1990 in the density in the Labrador Sea. And so, so what they say is, oh, if you increase the density of the Labrador Sea, that's going to increase the overturning circulation. So what happens is you increase the density in the Labrador Sea, you get an increase in the overturning circulation, and then that leads to an increase in the heat content um, in the North Atlantic. And then subsequently, like, there's a decrease in, in variability in, the, in um, heat content. Uh, sorry, There's a decrease in the density in the Labrador Sea, and that leads to a, a decrease in the temperature um, in the North Atlantic. And so this kind of, the, the change in the AMOC is, is explaining most of this variability that you see here. So that sort of tells a particular story, that peak heat content in the North Atlantic is controlled by the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. There have also been a couple of papers that kind of have a counter narrative, and this one by Chris Pikush. Uh, focuses on echo and again looks at the heat content in this area um, and he was looking at heat transport across this line which seems to be the thing that's primarily controlling heat content in the Labrador, Labrador Sea is ocean heat transport across this line and um, what they found was in this paper that the, the heat transport across this line is, seems to be primarily explained by the gyre and they used a particular method which I'll talk about later in the talk. Um, but this kind of highlights, right, that there is still a little bit of disagreement about whether the gyres or the overturning are important, and also it kind of highlights that maybe there's kind of a handoff, because depending on what latitude you choose, you might find that the, the overturning is moving most of the heat, and then you might choose a different latitude, and at that latitude, the gyres are more important. Um, and so, yeah, we, we want to really understand. Um, what's going on with the overturning versus the gyres. So I think one thing that I should say at this point is the wind sometimes influences the strength of the AMOC and the buoyancy sometimes influences the strength of the gyres. So in history, we've thought of those things as being separate. We've thought of the overturning circulation and the gyres as being separate things. But actually, and, and, and one is only controlled by the buoyancy as well, and one is only controlled by the wind. But actually, there's kind of this entangled mess of stuff, and so no separation is going to be, um, it's going to really separate those two drivers. But the goal here for me is to really just separate the two pieces, the gyres versus the overturning, so that then we can say, oh, well, the overturning is controlled by this much wind and this much buoyancy, and then we can do a further um, kind of reduction and, and separating out, budgeting where all of the variability is coming from. Um, okay, so final introductory slide. Um, like I said, the wind variability does seem to impact the AMOC, and I really like this paper by Larson et al. that shows that. So um, what they did was they ran um, a, 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 a climate model, and it would be a coupled climate model, except they mechanically decoupled the atmosphere from the ocean. And so that the winds that in the atmosphere were just taken, that, that were not used to force the ocean. 
So there was no interdecadal variability in the winds that they used to cause the ocean. They used some separate winds that had no interdecadal variability. And so all of this variability that they got came from only buoyancy, the effect of buoyancy. But when they compared to a simulation which was fully coupled, they found that even on long time scales, um, the kinds of variability that they got were different um, in a simulation that included um, wind being coupled between the atmosphere and the ocean versus um, the mechanically decoupled simulation. And so what that shows us is that even on long time scales, it seems like the wind is having some impact on the variability of AMOC. And one possibility, right, is that the wind actually affects the northward heat transport of heat and salt, and then that impacts the variability of AMOC. Uh, so that's, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to get you to think, like, there are a lot of pieces here, but we're just trying to separate out what is the AMOC what, and what is the gyres, and then hopefully that will help us to understand everything else that's going on, and particularly to answer um, some of these questions. What is the role of the jazz in moving heat northward at different time scales? Where do heat content anomalies originate? Um, like, are they coming from the equatorial region? Are they coming from further south? Or is, is, heat, con is, heat, is heat transport variability mostly just between the subpolar gyre and the subtropical gyre? And how is the AMOC involved in that? And how are the jazz involved? And then also, what controls the strength and the coherence of northward heat transport? Um, so by coherence, I mean like if the if the heat con if the if the heat transport at a particular latitude is correlated with the heat transport at a different latitude. And so, separating the AMOC and the dry heat transport is going to kind of help us answer some of these questions. I'm not promising that I'm going to answer these questions today, but I'm going to like start to create a framework where we can start. To um, okay, I wish I sort of had this up here one at a time, but um, so I used uh, the, the CSM large, large ensemble as a test bed for this, um, which is a 40 member fully coupled um, ensemble um, uh, and it, of CSM1, and it's for the period 1920 to 2100. And so how do you get, how do you get an ensemble? You change the initial conditions a tiny bit, and then you run forward, and the internal variability on the different ensemble members is going to be different. Um, I only look at the period 1940 to 2005. Why do I do that? Um, before 1940, probably these initial conditions haven't had time to have that much of an impact on the internal variability, and so the simulations are probably a bit more similar. So I wanted to give it a bit more time for the simulations to become different. And then also, I, after 2005, climate change just becomes a much bigger signal, and I didn't want to deal with that. I wanted to mostly look at the, the variability and not any trends. And so I, because I picked this period, I'm able to sort of say, oh, well, the, the heat transport trends are pretty small compared to the variability. I'll, I'm just dealing with the variability. And yeah, I used Pangeo Cloud to work with this data. This was like another, right, tilt. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, has there been a quantification of how long it actually takes for that internal variability to make sure? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and the answer is, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so it's possible that, yes, still in 1940, it does seem like there are some ensemble members that are all doing the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, but not all of them are doing the same thing. And yeah, it's a bit qualitative, or I do it, is the truth. Um, so yeah, I use Pangeo Cloud with this data. Um, and yeah, the CSM large ensemble is not the real world, but it has kind of similar decadal variability in subpolar ocean heat content. So what I did was I just kind of looked at the scale of this variability in ocean heat content over the period, and I looked at the same quantities in ECHO, and I said, oh, do these look similar? ECHO, right, is the data assimilating ocean model? Um, and the answer is yes. It seems like there are kind of similar variability going on in the heat content and also in the surface temperature. Um, so, right, we're not expecting that the decadal variability is going to be the same. And in fact, right, by design, it's not. We want our ensemble members to have different decadal variability. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the goal is just to understand the range of variability. Um, and so you can see here in CSM, the AMOC is, um, looks like this. We have 
I'm, I've plotted it in potential density space. So this is potential density, this is latitude. In at lighter densities, right, you have northward transport, that's what's represented here. And you have sinking in the North Atlantic and formation of deep water. And then you have southward transport at these dense densities. Um, and the, the black dashed lines represent places where I'm going to apply diagnostics. So 34 north, 26 north, and 5 south. And different ensemble members have uh, different AMOC uh, variability. So you can see here um, that this, this kind of box and whisker plot uh, represents the kind of scale of possible variabilities uh, between different ensemble members. Some ensemble members have less, some ensemble members have more. Whether that's statistically significant, it's not 100% clear. Um, but yeah, we have, we, these are just to show you that there are generally, there's more variability at 34 north than 26 north, and generally there's less variability at 5 south. Um, and yeah, I define the heat, the AMOC transport to be the maximum stream function. Um, so that's the maximum northward transport above uh, any possible isotherm. Um, okay, so now I've told you a bit about AMOC and CSM, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the different methods for separating, overturning, and gyres. And so, uh, yeah, here are some, some uh, here's the like, kind of thing that I want you to think about first when you think about partitioning heat, tra heat transport. So there's this thing called the gauge problem, right? And that means that any method we choose must be volume conserving. So here's an example. If we were to look at the heat transport through this orange region, so imagine this is, I'm going to show you this, this kind of uh, schematic a bunch of times. The Americas are over here, Europe is over here, this is depth, and this is longitude, right? And so this transport is northward, and this transport is southward. And so if I were to only look at the heat transport through in this orange box, it's not a well-defined thing, because you're going to need a reference temperature, and you could, you, you could for, for example, right, you could say, I want the heat transport, I'm going to take the transport times the temperature in degree C, right? And then, then you would get a particular number. But you could also say, I'm going to take the temperature in degrees Kelvin, and you'll get a totally different number. That's a very extreme example, but in any box, you probably want to take away a reference temperature. Um, and so this is not a very well-defined um, uh, heat transport. Whereas, if the total volume transport through a particular box is zero, right, then you're allowed to calculate the total heat transport, and it's not dependent on what reference temperature you pick. Um, and so if you pick the green region, and the green, the green region has no net volume transport, then we're allowed to um, find the heat transport through that box. So all of the different methods that I'm showing today have this property, that um, the, the volume that's associated with the AMOC is zero, and the volume transport that's associated with the gyres is also zero. This is the kind of traditional method, and then the one that was used by Paikush. And what they do is they take the zonal mean of the temperature, and they take the zonal average of um, the, the, they take the zonal integral of the transport. And so you can see, right, this is depth and this is longitude, and you take the zonal mean on a depth surface, you're going to get some profile of transport, and you're going to get some profile of temperature, and then you can multiply those two things together and integrate and get a single number that tells you the heat transport by the other. And then you can say, okay, well, everything that's left out, out is the heat transport by the gel. We're not going to worry about any other terms. That, this is what people usually do. Um, and this might be the best we can do. There are like times when this is the best method, I have to admit, admit. And that's because if you have some mooring observations, you might have them in a couple of locations. You know the depth that they were taken at, and you know approximately the volume transport between the moorings, because you can do that with geography, um, but you're not able to figure out, find any more complex information. So with observations, this might be the best method, but it has some clear downsides, right? We know flow does not follow depth surfaces. It's much more likely to follow isopignals. That's energetically um, a, a more energetically favored thing to do. 
And there's, uh, th there are some other features, like for example, if the gyre is, if, if some part of the gyre is actually flowing higher in the water column and then the return flow of the gyre is lower or vice versa, but if the, the gyre is distributed at all in depth, then that distribution is going to be piled into heat transport by the overturn, and we don't really want that. And there's like some very obvious cases where this doesn't work. So this is an example if you imagine, right, this again is the Americas, this is Europe, and you, if you have a northward transport on the western boundary that's warm, and a southward transport at depth, right, this is representing overturning. But in this example, I don't have any gyre transport. And yet, if I take the zonal mean temperature and I multiply by the zonal integral of transport, I'm not going to get the total heat transport because this temperature you get when you take the zonal mean is much, much cooler. And so the heat transport by the overturning tends to be underestimated and the heat transport by the gel tends to be uh, overestimated in this kind of setup. Um, so yeah, even though there's no gyre in this setup, um, a bunch of heat transport is attributed to the gyre. Often people, when I started talking about this as a problem, people started to suggest, oh well, we should be just doing this in density space. Like we've already learned that AMOC is a thing that we should be studying in density space. <laughs> uh, but, and so, and flow generally follows density surfaces, so that should be fine. But it actually ends up having really similar problems to this. Um, and that's because the isopignals slope up towards the surface on the western boundary. And so a lot of this uh, temperature, there's like a lot of hot water, hot, warmer water that's flowing northward right here. And then the density method, you're integrating zonally, but you're integrating along density surfaces to get this thing, these things that you're going to multiply together. And those density surfaces get both deeper, like the, the actual thickness of, between the density surfaces is wider, and also this water is just a lot colder because it's not near the surface anymore. Um, and so you actually end up with even less of a temperature difference between the surface and the bottom if you take the zonal average along density surfaces. And so you end up, again, underestimating the heat transport by the so I think in an ideal world, we would see particles in every model and look at heat transport from a Lagrangian perspective and then we could say, oh, what's actually happening is some water parcels are kind of getting stuck in the gyre and they're going around and around and they're transporting this much heat and some water parcels are continuing northward in AMOC and transporting a particular amount of heat. So this is just a schematic of like how you could do that in an idealized model um, based on something that I did a long time ago. But you could do this in a realistic model as well. Right? You could seed virtual part water parcels. You could look at the temperature that is associated with each of those water parcels. And if, but I want to be able to develop a method that is usable to actually compare models that have already been run. Um, and particularly, I would like to be able to compare coarse resolution models and high resolution models. I would like to compare different models in the CMIP6 suite. Um, and so I would like to have a diagnostic that I, that I can apply to any model. And I would like to be able to apply this diagnostic also to any tracer. I'm going to talk about heat, but like we could do it with carbon, right? We could do it with anything we like. Um, and so this is how I got to this place. And then I also was kind of aware of this ancient stormal work, um, which is about what is the aim of really, what, what, what is the transport that the surface really made up of? It's made of these two pieces I'm asserting. Um, it's made up of the AMOC, and the AMOC generally near the surface is going northward, right, and it's following the western boundary. So you have upwelling, maybe in the south, maybe in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and then that water follows the western boundary, it goes northward and sinks, and then on top of that you also have um, the gyres are also present at this kind of shallow depth. Um, and so I'm going to assert, right, that the northward flowing part of the AMOC plus the gyres is going to give the circulation at the top 1,500 meters, or particularly above an isopignal that's kind of dividing the southward flowing part of the AMOC from the northward flowing part of the AMOC. 
and so this is what it ends up looking like. Stommel came up with this sketch from from like adding those two things together. You have flow that sort of goes snakes around the gyres, and when you actually look in CSM, you get kind of a similar thing, right? The the red lines show the flow that's continuing northward, and then the blue lines generally show the flow that's recirculating in the gyre. And so this kind of gives you a way of splitting the the transport in the AMOT, which is going northward, from the transport in the gyre, um, which is going around and around. And so these black lines, again, represent the three latitudes at which I'm going to show you some results. How did we get this? Well, we got this from doing something called a pseudo-stream function, which is basically, you, it's like a stream function, but you do it above a particular density zone. So this is a little bit of an approximation, right, because to get a proper stream function, you need a 2D flow. Um, and the flow above a particular density surface is not 100% 2D, but uh, you are able to get something that looks pretty close to being a stream function um, by integrating the meridional velocity above a particular density from this coast um, eastward. Um, and yeah, that, that enables us to get this pseudo stream So, so I think the answer is just it ends up being weaker than everything else, and so it doesn't really show up here. But if I were to put more contours on the plot, you would see. It. Um, it's just that like this plot works better if I if I have like not too many contours right here, otherwise it just gets very really messy. Um, but good question. Can I ask? Yeah. Um, how how do you what's the distinction between the red and the blue? Um, so good question. The red are contours that, or at least most of the red are contours that uh, go from the south to the north, right? Okay. And then the blue are contours that recirculate. Now there are some exceptions over here, but that's to do with the fact that I just picked the, the value, right, of the contour. And so some of these contours that exist here exist over here, and some of these contours that exist here exist over here. Um, just generally, that you should focus on, like here there's recirculation, and here there's flow that goes through. And then the purple, right, is a, is, a, is a kind of contour that comes from the fact that it's not volume conserving, this pseudo stream function, and so you get some transport that appears at the boundaries, and that's the purple. Um, and how does the, um, how, how much does it depend on H? Like, when you change, so this is at like 700 meters, your, your capital H, or? I know, it, I, I pick a particular density, right, okay. rho m, and that rho m is the density associated with the maximum of the AMOC stream function. So above that, that density, the flow is northward, below that density, the flow is southward. So it's, it's actually kind of deeper, it's more like a thousand meters, um, okay. but it's, it's associated with a density, not a depth. And so the depth varies? Yes. Well, no, it's because this, okay, let me, uh, you're, you're asking okay. questions that I so, usually go off, yeah. but right, this is a heavy side function, yeah. right, and so it, this depth is from the bottom of the ocean to zero, but you only count the bit that's above uh, that particular ice. Uh, right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so the, 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 there is kind of, right, you can see here, you could potentially do a breakdown at any location, at any latitude. Um, but I'm going to pick a special case, and that special case is the case where um, the, the northward flow is on the western boundary. And that's just because at the moment I want to make key things as simple as possible, so I'm going to always pick a place where the AMOC is pinned to the western boundary. So, like here, where the red is close to the western boundary, here, the AMOC is close to the western boundary, here, the AMOC is close to the western boundary. And this means that um, it's easier to kind of separate out three individual regions. This yellow region is the northward heat transport by the AMOC, and it's separated from the green by this isopignal, the rho m isopignal, which is the isopignal that divides the, the place where the streamline, the, where, the, where the flow is northward, um, and the place where the flow is southward. Um, and so, yeah, so the yellow plus the green is the AMOC part, and we just say everything that flows through here is heat transport that's associated with AMOC, and then we say everything that's through the blue part 
this heat transport that's associated uh, with the giants. Um, you actually, and, and then, and then, right, you have this thing that you have to conserve volume, and so you specify X star such that the volume has to be conserved. Um, and so that's this loca the location of this division is based on the fact that there has to be zero volume transport through the blue and zero tra volume transport through the yellow plus the green. You also have to do some kind of little bit of time averaging. There are like going to be some months where the A mock is actually not positive. And this means that, uh, uh, yeah, th this X star is not well defined. And so you have to do a little bit of time averaging so that X star ends up being well defined at all times. And I do a 24 month working mean. And I'm going to name this at the moment the stream function splitting method. It's based on this thing called the pseudo stream function. And so I thought, well, this is like at least a kind of makes sense, right? We're splitting according to the stream function. It would be possible maybe to apply this method outside the Western boundary, but I think you can see there are like a few, quite a lot of details to be ironed out, and so I decided to do the simple thing first and only consider this case where um, the flow is on the Western boundary, because otherwise you have to define two different locations, the, the place where the one giant ends, the place where the A mod begins, and then vice versa. So I don't really, I just decided to do the simple case first. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, so yeah, I'm doing this special case, and here are the first results. Um, so I just first looked at where is X star, where is this location that splits the northward transport from the gyres, and uh, at 34 north, it's and at 26 north, and at 5 south, they're all like pretty stable under this definition. You don't have uh, X star that moves around over the basin. And I quite like that because it means that you're not worried that you're kind of like accidentally including a whole bunch of giant transport in your definition. So that took a little while to kind of get it to work nicely and pick good locations. Um, the other reason why I picked 34 and 4 north is actually possible to apply this further north in CSM, but CSM doesn't have a realistic separation of the Gulf Stream north of 34 north, and so I picked which brought all this data in the place um, to look at this. Um, so yeah, so so that's kind of the methods, and now I'm going to show you a couple of results. Um, first, um, before I show you anything about the new method, um, some context. Um, so the, the blue and orange solid lines um, show you the heat transport um, up two to 10 year time scales, and you can see there is quite a strong correlation at most times between um, the heat transport and the, the, the heat transport uh, the, and the AMOC transport. So AMOC transport is in spur drops. This is actually just AMOC transport. I haven't used any method to separate heat transport by the AMOC. This is the correlation between, well, it's a lap. So you can look at the correlation between AMOC and heat transport, and you can see they're pretty correlated, except at a few specific time. And that's true at 34 north, at 26 north, and at 5 south. And yeah, the solid lines show this 2 to 10 year time scale, and then the dashed lines show a much longer, the 10 plus year time scale. So I'm trying to kind of divide out what's the short time scale variability that's more likely to be due to wind, that's probably the 2 to 10 year time scale, and then longer time scale aim of variability is going to be um, on the 10 plus year time scale. And yet you can see generally in both cases, heat transport is very correlated with AMOC transport. Um, and you can look at this a different way. These are all individual ensemble members. And this is the standard deviation of the AMOC. So if you have more AMOC variability, it's going to be further to the right. If you have less AMOC variability, it's going to be further to the left. And you can see um, and the black crosses and the green crosses are the more northern locations. And at those locations, even for two to 10 year variability, there's this really high correlation between AMOC transport and the heat transport. And then at 5 South, there's a less, little bit less of a correlation between heat transport and AMOC transport. And then on multi-decadal timescales, there's even more of this correlation between um, uh, heat transport and AMOC transport. So it really seems like on multi-decadal timescales, AMOC is probably driving most of the heat transport, although we haven't done any 
um, separation yet using my new method. Um, and then there are a few um, ensemble members where you see less of this correlation. And I do think this is like something to be explored more in the future. Um, but so this is kind of what it looks like to apply my new method. Um, you can see over here, right, the western boundary current is northward, that's what the red is, and then there's a little bit of recirculation southward that's blue, um, and there's also southward transport over here that's more associated, I mean, it's all associated with the drive. And so in our new method, when we apply our new method, we say everything in this hatched region, which is like, right, shallow and west of the western boundary, is associated with the gyre. This like black, this region over here that's bordered by the black line and the black contour is associated with northward transport of the overturning. And then all of this in the deep ocean is associated with southward transport of the overturning. So basically like this is just the kind of version of the schematic with the real um, velocities on. Um, and yeah. So this is kind of what we're, we're applying. And what do we find? We find that, oh, I thought I had, yes, exactly, okay. Well, I'm gonna show you um, the fraction of two to 10 year heat transport variability attributed to AMOC at 30 degree north. And I'm gonna particularly show you the variance explained. Um, so, so what this tells you is the fraction of the variance that it, that's explained by ocean heat transport attributed to AMOC by various methods. So, right. That means that, for example, over here, we have, we, we, we're telling you how much of the total heat transport is explained by the AMOC heat transport as diagnosed by this Z space um, So if we just look right over here, um, I know this is not, I, yeah, I knew I screwed something up. So this is the two to 10 year ocean heat transport variance explained by AMOC. And you can see here on the left um, we, that about 90% of the variability is explained in Z space. I should say that here, yes. In, ma in the mathematical method in Z space, it ascribes more than 90% of the variability to overturning on two to 10 year time scales. The density method describes only about 60% of the variability to overturning, or maybe even only 50% right here. Um, and so, right, you can see that's perhaps in line with what I said before. The density method always underestimates the amount of heat transport variability associated with AMOC. And then the extreme function splitting method actually gets really pretty similar results um, to the original uh, method. So, you know, maybe, maybe we did all this work and there's not that much difference. Um, uh, but yeah, the density method consistently gives low values for AMOC, and that's because of this thing where the ice can slope upwards. Um, and this, the uh, isopignals that start over here in this region where there's strong northward heat transport all go down here, and so you end up averaging all of that in to your uh, diagnostic for density, which is good. Uh, okay, so this one, I think now we're back, um, is the fraction of 10 plus year heat transport variability attributed to AMOC at 34 north. So again, at 10 plus year time scales, there's even more, slightly more variability is attributed to AMOC in the Z space method. In the Z C space method, again, less variability is attributed to AMOC. And in fact, we're always going to basically ignore the density space method from now on because the density space method always gives like a really lowball estimate for a non heat transport variability attributed to AMOC. And then the new method says more than 100% of heat transport variability is attributed to AMOC. How is this possible? Like maybe, uh, maybe I'm doing something totally wrong. Like why, why does it look like that? And what this actually means is right, that the gyre is compensated. So you have northward heat transport by the AMOC, and then at times when you have northward heat transport by the AMOC, it's compensated by southward heat transport um, by the gyre. And this is actually one of the nice things about the new method. Um, you can get situations where there's compensation in the other two methods, but it's not really clear when you look at them, like what does, the comp what does that compensation mean? What is the gyre? What is the AMOC in these methods? You, you, because we don't really have a clear 
uh, like mental picture of what the AMOC is in the Z space method, it's very hard to know what is what things are compensating each other. Um, and, and could it be some of these funny things that come from the fact that you're doing a zonal average? Whereas at least in this method, right, you can see when there's a high heat transport over here in the AMOC piece, that leads to higher temperatures in the north, and then those higher temperatures in the north are associated with more southward transport by the time. And so this compensation kind of makes sense in this new method. Ah. And so, right, this is the fraction of 10 plus year heat transport variability attributed to AMOC at 34 north, um, and all of the methods ascribe uh, more um, heat transport at 10 plus year time scales um, than at, at shorter time scales, but kind of same vibes of what's going on. And then at 20, 26 north, um, the, the, the results are basically pretty similar. We have this, again, we have this kind of uh, region which we're associating with the Jaya, the region that we're associating with uh, the AMOC, and uh, we're looking at putting, we're, we're separating, right, so the heat transport through the region that's associated with the Jaya is put into the Jaya, and then the heat transport through this region, and this region is associated with AMOC. Okay, and so the fraction of 2 to 10 year for heat transport variability attributed to A1 to 26 north, again, you get mostly the mathematical method in Z space attributes most of the variability, or basically 100% of the variability, to AMOC. The density method gives you this low ball estimate. And the stream function splitting method, again, ascribes 100%. So you get this really similar result between the two methods. Definitely, I could have checked these a little bit more. Um, okay, and then the stream function splitting method suggests there is some compensation between the gyres and the overturning at long uh, time scales. Again, so same story. Why did I show you 26 mil? That's a different question. So. I was just going to ask: Is there a way to assess how much of that signal is compensation? Like, if you have like in the previous one, you have exactly 100 percent essentially. Does that mean there's no compensation, or does that mean...? There is compensation, but it's, yeah, I, I think that that's an interesting question, and, and I think it does raise a question of what does compensation mm -hmm. mean, right? right. Uh, because certainly, probably, the Jaya is bringing more heat southward when the AMOC is bringing more heat northward, but also, um, yeah, I don't think that... I don't think it's possible for that to be true and, and to get 100%, uh, right? If you have any compensation, then you should get more than that. Yeah, okay. I think that's the answer. Well, I haven't really thought about that. Um, oh, okay, here we go. So why did I show you 26 North when it, was it gave you exactly the same answer? Well, the answer is um, there's, there's this one thing that I wanted to do, which is show how correlated the estimates of heat transport due to AMOC are. So right, we apply the stream function splitting method, we get the heat transport due to AMOC from the stream function splitting method, and then we see how correlated is that estimate at between 26 north and 34 north. And the answer is they're very correlated. And that's what you would expect, right? You would expect that um, if you have AMOC and it's transporting stuff heat northward, it, it's going to keep transporting the same heat north with at 26 north and at 34 north. And there's not going to be that much change. But if you use the Z, Z uh, space method, you actually don't get the, so much correlation between the two latitudes. And it's because the Z space method is doing some kind of arbitrary uh, kind of uh, bucketing of what heat transport is due to AMOC and what heat transport is due to uh, gyres, and it happens to give similar results to the stream function splitting method, but those th those results are just not very correlated between latitudes in a way that suggests that probably the least space method is not actually doing a good job um, in reality. Finally, there's five south. Five south, honestly, is like a bit of a it's like an interesting result, and probably shows to you that this method kind of highlights some places where there's just more complex stuff going on. And the, the key reason is, right, again, this is depth, this is a longitude, and we attribute this area 
you know, new matter to be Enoch and this area to be the Jaya. But this area that is, contains the Jaya, actually it contains the subtropical cells. So, right, this southwards transport um, near the surface and northward transport a little bit below it is not associated with the Jaya, it's associated with the subtropical cell, which again, is probably a wind driven, primarily wind driven circulation, but it is in the vertical. And so you're going to see this leads to you getting really different results from the two methods. Um, and so, right, the, again, the, um, the Z space method attributes 90% of variability to the overturn. The density method gives you this global answer. And then the stream function splitting method attributes much less of this variability to the overturn. And the large difference here is basically caused by the fact that the way you might categorize the different parts of the flow is different, right? Um, so let's see if we have another possible map. So right over here, the, all of this area gets considered to be the gyre in the stream function splitting method. But in the z-space method, the, the, the part of the flow that's associated with the subtropical cell is vertical. And so that part gets associated with the angle. Now, the, the question is basically philosophical. What, do you think that the subtropical cell is able or is it not able? I don't know. Like, I, I don't have the answer. But I think this kind of does highlight that like, not, in not all locations do we have a complete like, idea of what we're actually even trying to do. Um, oh yeah, and then on 10-year timescales, you actually get much more similar variability between the z-space method and the stream function splitting method. Why is that? It's because the subtropical cell variability gets kind of averaged out on these one time scales. And so um, you get much more agreement for the variabilities, again, due to what we are sure is AMOC and not including the subtropical cell. Uh, I'm going to skip these probably. This is basically the same stuff. Yeah, like most of the heat transport is due to AMOC, maybe a little bit less than, uh, than uh, previous latitudes. Okay. And yeah, at this latitude, there's also this huge variation between ensemble numbers, um, which I don't understand them in the uh, uh, thought. But so, right, this kind of highlights that there's kind of a bit of a philosophical problem between about like, is this little blue circulation, which is the subtropical cell, which is primarily due to wind, but exists in density space, is this part of the AMOC or is it not? Okay, so here are some conclusions. The mathematical method in density space seems to underestimate the heat transport by AMOC. I recommend that we do not use it at all. Um, my new physically motivated method appears to be more successful at kind of picking apart the different parts of the transport and associated with AMOC in locations where the best western boundary current is more well defined, so like haven't applied it everywhere, it seems to work there. And maybe we might need some Lagrangian particles to kind of understand the relationship between AMOC and gyres and um, and the subtropical cell at five cell. Um, okay. I had more but it is that we're now 50 minutes in so I'm gonna stop and say thank you and please ask me some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, students, question. Evan, yeah. before you raise your hand, what is your question? Um, okay, so your stream function splitting method, when you show it and you show the heat transport, it seems like it is cutting right through the western boundary. Yes. And I guess my question is, do you think it makes sense to say anything west of a certain point is definitely going to go north and anything east of a certain point is definitely going to be recirculated. And I guess maybe what you're getting at with like a Lagrangian perspective of tracers would make more sense. But I, I would think that like the whole western boundary current might at certain points have all of that energy going north or all of it getting recirculated versus this where you're kind of splitting it down the middle. Um, I think that's a really good question and uh, highlights like yeah some of the difficulties with not doing Lagrangian um, particles. But like I think the answer is Certainly, right, a volume that's the same as this volume goes north, and a volume that's the same as this volume gets recirculated. And 
if you actually look at Lagrangian studies, usually the, the Lagrangian particles that are really, really, really far close to the western in, in the western boundary, those Lagrangian particles do go north. So there's probably some gradient of like particles or water particles that are really over here to the west go northward, and then they get more and more likely to get recirculated. And some of these still go northward, and, and then as you get further right into the gyre, and stuff doesn't go northward. So there's probably a bit of a probability distribution. And I'm kind of trying to skim over that a little bit because like, if you want to apply this to multiple models, in order to kind of understand that distribution, you'd have to understand a lot about the mixing, and, and like what's going on at different latitudes, and, uh, yeah, like, I've, it's already complicated enough. I want it to be simple as possible. But I think, yeah, you're, you're, you're pointing out something that's true and that the reason why the project process are useful. Liz. Sure. This is super cool. I really like this method because it makes so much more sense as a way to divide overturning entire compared to, like, other things. Something, that, uh, something that's been heard a lot of is, oh, you should never use depth space AMOC for your climate diagnostics. It's not physically based. In the subpolar gyre, you're getting it wrong to use that. So I'm wondering, with your method, if you test it, if you use like that, instead of a critical density as your dividing line between you know, overturning this way or that way, if you tested it with like a maximum depth to see how much that matters or not, um, like, because, okay, sure, I, I will concede the fact that AMOC in depth space is not as physically motivated as things move along nice and signals, but you're showing that using depth method for heat transport might be almost as good as the stream function, and it's a lot simpler. Have you tested that? Have you, like, you know, maybe pushed back on these folks who are saying you cannot use depth-based MOC for anything because it's just not physically motivated? Um, yeah, the answer to all of the above is no, um, but, like, I don't disagree with what you're saying, like especially because you're only looking at one surface, and actually, the depth of this surface, it, the, what results you get is quite ins insensitive to which I which I think you pick because like I'm, all of the heat transport is actually happening up here, right? Um, and so it shouldn't matter very much. So I think the answer is probably you could do it in depth space if you would probably get similar results, and it probably would be fine. Uh, but no, I haven't done. To hear that because we were working with Steve about but as you are aware, it is just so difficult to get things in the same space and the right and yeah. you can get away with that. Yeah. I was wondering, you were alluding to some results. Maybe do you have some of the Grungian tracer results in those? I know the what's in the latest slides is or I mean oh, I should say before moving on, uh, there's a preprint if anyone is interested. Um, so if you want to apply this method, please look at the thing. Um, and then, so what I, yeah, my, my next slides are about the fact that I'm trying to get Lagrangian particles online in on 6 with a goal of starting to, to, to look at heat transport uh, from that perspective. But I would like the particles to be online so that then I have the most accurate trajectories and I'm able to compare both high resolution and coarse resolution simulations. Um, and that's a little bit of a struggle, and yeah, I maybe I'll skip a lot of this, but um, uh, basically, like, I have this new scheme for advecting particles online in Mod 6, which is a challenge because Mod 6 has, has this vertical grid that moves in space, and so you actually need a different uh, advection scheme from any previous model that's had online particle advection, at least in the ocean. <laughs> I, I cannot speak for atmospheric models. Um, and so yeah, we have this new scheme, which is, uh, it's basically finished, I am, in fact I should stop saying it's basically finished, it's finished, I am writing documentation. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that this hopefully will help both with my work, but it might help with your work too, if you're interested in online particle, looking at the logic particles. Um, Thank you. Compensation between the and, and why and I guess I don't fully understand why that doesn't show up in the Z space method versus. Um, okay, so I think the that's a good question. Um, why does this not show? Up? Okay, so yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, 
So why does it not show up in the DC space method? Sorry, before you, sorry, sorry to interrupt before you get started. Can you remind me the you got the covariance uh, divided by the covariance between what? And okay, the, the covariance is between the, the total heat transport and the heat transport associated with A mock, mm -hmm. and then we divide by the total variance of the heat transport. Yeah. And so that tells you right how much of the heat transport is explained by A mock in that particular method. Yeah. Um, so good, good, yeah, good to remember that. Um, and so the answer is yes. In some, actually, in some, in some ensemble members, there is compensation even in the Z space method. Um, but uh, why is there not compensation all the time? Well, I think the answer is just these methods are actually doing really different things, and the Z space method kind of always is diluting the heat transport associated with AMOC. Um, and so reducing, so kind of kind of artificially reducing the heat transport variability that you see because it's averaging this northward, this, the temperature over here, which tends to be warmer, with temperatures over here, which tend to be cooler. Um, and so I think the answer is yes, there is compensation. <laughs> there is compensation going on here probably. It's just that that's also being masked by this additional effect that you're doing the zonal Physically, why would you why would you see that compensation? I mean, what would be responsible for that compensation in the first place? Um, I mean, basically, when you have more heat transport, so you actually only see right this compensation on long track scales. So when you have a lot of heat transport that's going northward for a while, that causes the the, the part of the ocean that's north of the latitude that you're looking at to be warmer, right? And then that causes there to be more heat available to so come back southward in the south. And I think it's really that simple. Thanks. Evan, given that like, you're describing this compensating method, do you think you could do a sort of lag analysis where you see that exact physical like step through that and see whether or not after a certain amount of time of AMOC transporting obviously more water, if you see like a shift in the, the latitudinal extent of the gyre or a shift in would you be able to find that and find the, the time scales at which that's happening? Because you also only get it when you're doing the, that low frequency pass. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, and it's something maybe that you can do in the like the, the historical run too, where you have a really long period of time. To look for. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think that's a good idea. Um, I have not done it. I've been trying to finish this one. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is. Anything else? Well then, let's thank our speaker once more.